so that so that by book eight, Glaucon, I think, has already been convinced through the image of the cave that the philosophers escape from the city's conventions to emerge into the sunlight of the eternal truth is the happiest way of life. Socrates also says that because he is devoted to studying the idea of the good, the philosopher is the only truly just person. So in book seven, the philosophic life has already displaced the just life of the citizen, although it may be that the philosophic life is reached by way of the city and by way of civic virtue. Okay, so with that in mind, let's review the main points of book, books eight and nine. Book eight begins a steady distancing from the best regime because it has turned out after all to be neither possible nor desirable due to the extreme demands it places on human nature through the communism of property and the abolition of the family. Do I have to push this panel about the meeting being recorded or should I press continue? Or? I'm seeing a window here saying this meeting is being recorded. I, I pressed, I pressed continue. Yeah, and press it, Randy. No I'll, I'll, press I'll press continue. Sorry about, sorry about that. Anyway, the best regime is now, we're told in book eight, located in the most distant past, worthy of veneration, but impossible to recover. Socrates also terms it a pattern in the sky. So the best regime is both extremely distant from us in time and also transcends the here and now as a heavenly pattern. So it's both long ago and far away. One thing that we've learned in the course of the Republic is that the best regime is not available to us here and now, but the philosophic life is available to us here and now. So although we can't have the best regime, we can found the best regime in our individual souls guided by that pattern in the sky, a kind of celestial moral compass. By locating the best regime in the most distant past, Socrates can suggest a decline from its high standards in the regimes we encounter today without ever suggesting that the best regime can be brought back. Reinvoking the parallel between the city and the soul he introduced in book two, Socrates tells us in book eight that there are five regimes paralleled by five types of people. The principles of these different regimes are in descending order, wisdom, that's the now unrecoverable best regime. Honor, the regime is called democracy, rule according to honor. Money, that regime is called oligarchy. Freedom, that's democracy. And at the lowest level, erotic pleasure, that's tyranny. So the best regime provides a standard for evaluating and ranking the inferior regimes. I think Socrates wants a standard that includes the highest individual attainment, philosophy, which we can still possess, even though we cannot bring back the regime governed by philosophy, a standard that casts more doubt on the other regimes and prevents them from claiming our total loyalty. Whatever system of government we find ourselves living under, we can be guided by the moral compass of the best regime, the pattern in the sky, and try to do what's right. In effect, having taken, excuse me, in effect, having taken Glaucon and Adiamantus out of the cave to glimpse the sunlight of the eternal truth, Socrates is leading them back down into the cave now equipped to view everyday political life in light of the highest standard. In the absence of the best regime, the best way of life, 
philosophy is still possible privately. So in a sense, politics points beyond itself. The best regime is impossible, but philosophy is always possible. Now, as we examine Socrates' ranking of the regimes, we observe that the more desires and passions predominate in the citizenry, the lower is the rank of the regime. This is because Socrates, I would argue, wants to defame tyranny, whose sole pursuit is unrestrained erotic pleasure. Also, as we descend the hierarchy from the best regime to the worse, the individuals in the city become less and less like the city itself. In other words, the worse the regime, the more the parallel between the individual and the city begins to widen and break down. Or, in other words, the less there is of a common good. Finally, when we reach rock bottom with tyranny, there is no longer any parallel between the individual and the city, only the most supremely selfish individual. Hence, in a way, tyranny isn't a form of government at all. Now, the second best regime, democracy, is a lot like Sparta, as many people have observed. Its, its principle is a love of honor, but as Socrates presents it, it harbors a secret love of wealth that it is ashamed to display openly. The next lowest regime, oligarchy, is explicitly devoted to wealth and to private self-interest. It doesn't embrace honor, but you can say it has a kind of bourgeois sobriety. The next worst regime, democracy, proclaims freedom and equality for all. They are libertines who consume the wealth that the oligarchy had amassed. Even their pets are lying in the road dead drunk. That, 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 that's how corrupt a city it is. Demagogues arise to inflame the people against their betters and enrich themselves. That leads directly into tyranny. The tyrant is the biggest demagogue of all, who exploits everyone else by pandering to their desires while making himself supreme. Now, Socrates also depicts this ranking of regimes, interestingly, as a series of sons who reject their fathers and embrace a worse principle. So in the best regime, which Socrates now calls aristocracy, because it's the rule of the best, in other words, the philosophers, the son rebels against the philosophic life's lack of honor and courage. In other words, it's been argued that the cause of the best regime's overthrow is actually the rebellion of the warrior class of auxiliaries against the ruling class of the guardians, or otherwise expressed, the rebellion of spiritedness or thumos against reason and the shattering of the alliance proposed by Socrates in book four that Thumos might assist reason in curtailing desire. That leads to democracy, rule according to honor, but now the Timocrat son rebels against the father's excessive pride because he disdained to court popularity with the many and has very little property. So the Timocrat's sons establish oligarchy the regime devoted to making money. In turn, the oligarch's sons establish democracy, they spend their father's money on pleasure, and they lose the bourgeois virtues of thrift and hard work that their fathers lived by. That brings us to book nine and to tyranny. Tyranny is the radicalization of the private pleasures, which kicked off the whole cycle of decline of the regimes, beginning with democracy. It comes out of the pure freedom and hedonism of democracy. There's, there's a straight follow through, Socrates argues, from democracy to tyranny. 
One implication of this may be that when philosophy no longer rules the city, degeneration sets in because the only alternatives now are between duty, in other words, democracy, and bodily desires, in other words, oligarchy and democracy. And neither of these is able to make people completely happy or satisfied. This may confirm what Socrates says in book seven, that the philosopher, because he devotes his life to studying the idea of the good, is the one truly prudent and virtuous man. In other words, only the philosopher is consistently moderate. <clears throat> the tyrant, on the other hand, is a monster of desires. He wants all possible and available pleasures. And as Socrates puts it, Eros leads his soul like a demagogue leads the mob, because the tyrant's soul is a mob of erotic excesses. <clears throat> now, Socrates' argument against tyranny, it's interesting to note, is not primarily one of moral condemnation. Instead, Socrates argues that the philosophic life is erotically more satisfying than the tyrant's life. In other words, he defeats tyranny on its own terms. The reason for this is, I think, that the tyrant is addicted to bodily pleasure and therefore dependent on the external material means needed to gratify those passions. Those material means, luxurious food, drink, palaces, victims, are perishable. And the tyrant's pleasures are temporary, meaning that the tyrant's erotic appetites are never satisfied, and he must go on and on, finding wealth and victims to exploit in order to gratify them. This means, Socrates argues, that inwardly, the tyrant is actually miserable exhausted by the constant need to gratify his desires and suspicious of everyone around him of secretly hating him and wanting to overthrow him. The philosopher, by contrast, gratifies his pleasures by studying the eternal good. This means that he is not dependent on external and perishable material means. His pleasure is entirely inward and he does not need to exploit other people. We encountered an earlier version of this prescription in book six, where Socrates argued that the philosopher's eros was entirely absorbed in the love of wisdom, meaning that his other passions were sluiced off and deflected from the bodily pleasures that most people pursue, meaning that outwardly, his behavior was always just and moderate. Whether his inner motivation is justice or simply his own personal happiness remains an open question. Now, we should observe that fundamentally, Socrates' proof that the philosopher's way of life is more erotically satisfying than the tyrant's way of life is based upon different cosmological principles. Tyrants live according to whim, impulse, and passion. That means they are attracted to the view that the world as a whole is irrational and characterized by chance becoming, that nature is, as Heraclitus put it, war or strife. Their tyrannical disorder mirrors the disorder they believe exists at the heart of life. The philosopher, by contrast, is searching for knowledge of the eternal causes of the whole. For Socrates, the cosmos is characterized by harmony, orderliness, and balance. A happy life consists of trying to cultivate those qualities of moderation and harmony in one's own soul through the pursuit of wisdom and virtue. Contrary to Heraclitus and the other pre-Socratics and Sophists, for Socrates, the one takes priority over the many, rest takes priority over motion, and being takes priority over becoming. Now, the question remains, are we convinced by Socrates' proof 
that the philosopher is happier than the tyrant. And what if we citizens trying to be, and, and, and sorry, what, what about we citizens who are trying to be just, but are not philosophers? Uh, Socrates, I would say, has not explicitly argued that the life of the just citizen is happier than the tyrant's life, only that the philosopher is. So where does that leave the rest of us? What, what's the status of citizen virtue that is not necessarily connected to the philosophic life? And another question I'll leave you with is, is Socrates' depiction of the tyrant as a monster of erotic excess a full and adequate description of the varieties of tyranny and despotic authority? It might apply to Nero or Caligula, but does it apply to Cyrus the Great, to Julius Caesar, to Napoleon? Is this a conscious omission on Socrates' part? To, to describe a kind of rational despotism. And if it is a conscious omission, what might his motivation be? And I'll, I'll uh, conclude my remarks there. Thank you very much uh, for, for the presentation. Uh, was, uh, there are lots of, lots of thoughts where we citizens or we who are just students of philosophy where we fit in in contemporary world, you have written about that, but 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 let's let's turn to students if they have any question about clarification. Whether you discuss what thumos is, I guess uh, a call you have discussed it. If not, we could we could uh, we could embellish that term important term a bit, or are any any question clarification you first want to to hear. Uh, let's 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 try to, to 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 push students first, and then 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 we, we come in if you don't mind. Uh, in uh... okay, so if we if we may, we have a question. Actually, we have two questions. Um, the first question: When we have the classification of the five regimes, right? We have aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. Where would um, monarchy fall, and what would be like the key, um, wor um, I don't know, quality that comes with comes with the regime of um, of the monarchic regime? And then the second question would be um, when you describe that um, the life of a philosopher is um, or f philosophic life is also pleasurable and um, your desires, um, the erotic desires are, you know, fulfilled. Um, shouldn't um, shouldn't uh, it also be, shouldn't pleasure, erotic pleasure, not only be part of tyranny, but also the life of the regime where philosophers, you know, function or come from, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, completely. Um... As for monarchy, um, I don't know if others have been struck by this, but there's kind of an ambiguity in the um, unfolding of the best regime, where at times we're led to believe that there is a philosopher king, right? But at other times, he speaks of a kind of collective rule by, by the guardians who, 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 are, who are given a philosophical education. Um, so the status of monarchy is somewhat, um, I think, obscure in, in the Republic. Uh, and I think it has something to do with the wish on Socrates' part in this context, not to entertain the notion of a good form of monarchy. Uh, he certainly does this in other works, uh, like in, in book four of the laws, he, he actually discusses the possibility that um, a civic spirited tyrant might found a, a just society. And in many of um, the platonic dialogues, the, 
the, the art of ruling is identified with the art of rational monarchy, uh, a, a kind of rational despotism. Uh, and of course, if you look at other Socratics like Xenophon, you have the full blown um, description of, uh, of, of a kind of rational despotism. So I don't, I don't have any an answer to this except that to say that the Republic has a kind of massively pro-Republican in, in the sense of Republican self-government emphasis. It, it, it wants to stress the desirability of self-governing communities. And so I think it sort of puts to one side the question of whether some form of absolute rule could actually be beneficial. But in many of his other dialogues, Socrates frequently pursues this analogy, you know, between, between craft and ruling. And, and that leads you almost inexorably toward some uh, some rational monarch like Cyrus the Great, the great king of Persia. This is the argument of the Alcibiades I, of the Theages. But in the Republic, I, I think it's sort of like put off to one side. And we're invited to believe that tyranny inevitably and automatically leads to a life of the most despicably craven erotic self-indulgence, whereas in fact, we know from real life that that's not necessarily true. I mean, Xenophon Cyrus is, 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 uh, is, is, is notable for his asceticism and his lack of um, personal erotic self-indulgence. Um, as for your other question, uh, you know, it really comes down to whether we're convinced by Socrates when he makes this argument that somehow by devoting all of your erotic desires to a pursuit of the truth or a love of the truth that it, it in effect drains away your other passions um, and, and at the same time fully satisfies them. And I just don't know whether uh, that's true or not. It's certainly not true of my life. And, and, uh, and, and yet he seems to mean this argument. He, he seems to make this argument quite seriously in, in book nine, you know, that, that the, 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 the philosopher's life is not merely more just and virtuous than the, uh, than the uh, tyrant's life, but is in fact more satisfying. And, and you know, that, that certainly entered the tradition as one of the great, you know, arguments uh, for, for preferring philosophy to, to tyranny. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any, any other clarification, students, uh, or question, comments? Cetazar has a question. Yes, yes. Oh, Cetazar, please. Yes. Well, I have a number of questions. I don't know uh, with which one I would start, but uh, maybe I would start with uh, the thing that you said uh, that whether we're persuaded about the fact that Socrates claims that uh, the philosopher would be truly happier than a tyrant. Well, I would imagine a very, very theoretical situation where the tyrant doesn't have to somehow mind of people turning behind his back and he would be like an absolute despotic tyrant where everybody would listen and everybody would be happy. Like in this way, I would understand that uh, basically this tyrant would be happier than the philosopher. But uh, it's, it's, it's a complex thought, so I would, I would, I would try to elaborate wouldn't this tyrant then resemble kind of uh, the philosopher ruler that Socrates kind of wants to have? Uh, I don't know if you get my question, but uh, if we conclude that the tyrant wouldn't have anybody minding uh, that he's doing wrong, he would be happy. And maybe he would be happier than the philosopher. Uh, so therefore, wouldn't that be the same situation of the philosopher king that would basically 
just be happy with finding out the good and the wisdom. But what would happen if actually he has found the good and everybody listens to him? Like, would the philosopher king be actually happy? Well, that, that's that's a wonderful question, um, and and I think that in other places, Plato and his Socrates do entertain something like that prescription. In in the Statesman, for example, um, we're we're told there that um, a certain kind of philosopher can sort of have a direct noetic intuition of the good and then translate that directly into the art of ruling in a way that would be despotic yet benevolent. So, the, and, and, and again, I, I would point to uh, Socrates' own frequent praise of the great king of Persia as one of the fundamental alternatives uh, in, in political life. Um, in, in the Alcibiades one, he seems to, seems to argue to Alcibiades that you should either opt for that kind of rational monarchy, like, like the great king, or for Sparta, which is a true self-governing republic. By implication, Athens kind of drops out as a sort of messy halfway house. So because this is the case, then we have to ask ourselves, why does the republic seem to go out of its way to, to exclude this alternative um, of a rational and benevolent yet absolute despotism? And the only answer I have to that, not, not terribly profound, is that, um, you know, Glaucon and Adiamantus are probably about 16 years old. And I think that what Socrates is trying to do here, especially with Glaucon, who I think so obviously exhibits a certain attraction to tyranny. You know, he claims he's only saying what everyone, he's being frank about what everyone secretly thinks. But part of the pedagogical purpose, I think, is that Socrates thinks that someone this young can be deflected from the tyrannical temptation and, and that, you can head off those, those Achilles-like passions, at, at, head them off at the pass with a proper form of education. So, so that's how I see the rhetorical purpose of the Republic as a whole. But, but again, in other contexts, Socrates or, or certainly Plato seems very open to, the, to entertaining the idea that, that you could have a form of of, of absolute monarchy that was both rational and despotic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Laura, Laura, Blazikova, please. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering whether you think that it would be possible for Tyrant to possess self-knowledge. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a splendid question. Um, not the Tyrant presented in book nine of the Republic, I don't think. I, I think the implication of the way in which Socrates critiques tyranny in book nine is, is precisely that the tyrant could never have self-knowledge. Be, be, because, you know, to quote that line again, Socrates says that er, Eros, Eros rules the tyrant's soul like the demagogue rules the mob. But the demagogue rules the mob by gratifying the passions of the mob and thereby gratifying his own passions. So I think in the Republic, the answer is no. Um, in, in book four of the laws, which is this locus classicus where the Athenian stranger says, well, what, what of a young tyrant who has an eros for the city could be enlisted to found what will become the just society, except that it's gonna to have to be founded tyrannically. And in that context, the Athenian stranger says, well, it could work as long as that young tyrant has a, a mentor, a philosophical mentor who will guide him and moderate him. But then the Athenian stranger kind of just throws his hands up and says, well, you know, that's so unlikely to ever come about. And even if it did come about, 
who's to say the young Connor won't just throw throw the older advisor, you know, uh, overboard and do what he wants to do. I mean, a real life example of this actually would be um, Cicero's deluded belief that he could control the boy Octavian Caesar, as he disparagingly referred to him, that that he as a philosopher statesman could mold the young Octavian into a servant of the Republic. And of course, um, Octavian just absolutely stabbed him in the back and threw him over. So yeah, that's, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, maybe, maybe Plato thinks it's just more salutary to avoid experimenting with some sort of perfect government through despotism and, and just accept, you know, Republican self-government with all of its messiness, you know? If we had time, we could talk about Plato's own experience in Syracuse with Dion, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Please, any any other questions from from students? No. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, you speak. Speak louder. We cannot hear you, uh, Michal. Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions to ask Mr. Mueller about the Christ life going to Lucia and then me. So Lucia can put, put put the microphone near your near near yourself because it's still not very audible. Okay, so hello Lucia. Uh, and uh, I'm Mr. Mueller from Lucia Christ. Uh, I want to clarify something. So Socrates claims that no person right for, um, once, once again, please, we couldn't hear you. Can you hear us? Uh, uh, speak uh, directly to the microphone, please. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. So, um, Socrates um, claim is that no um, present regime is suitable for service uh, integration to be fully accomplished. And um, um, so, and we also, um, but we can still presume uh, the, the philosophic life in our tribe. Can you hear us? Very badly, at least me. Okay, so I can write it into English. Please, please write, write that question. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, any, anybody else uh, bef before we turn? Sophie or Christina Svetozar, do you have another question, Marcus? Yes, I have another question, if nobody uh, has uh, for now. Well, uh, I was thinking it's, uh, it's more of a practical matter, but uh, since uh, we're having this uh, kind of uh, order of talking about the regimes, we're starting basically uh, in the ideal city, of Kalipolis and we're moving to democracy, oli oligarchy, democracy, and then tyranny. Well, uh, let's suppose that uh, Socrates would find himself in a democracy. Well, which he actually finds himself, right? In Athens, uh, would his steps towards establishing Kalipolis be actually the reverse steps that uh, he would need to establish all of those orders uh, back and then come into aristocracy. Like, I would wonder, it's, it's, it's just a yeah. question of speech, you know, like uh, we can hypothesize, but I'm just <laughs> interested, how would we be able to create uh, Socrates' ideal city in speech from a democracy? So I'm just, I'm just going to channel Alan Bloom here, who, who was my teacher. And this argument is not original to me, but I'm convinced by it, that it, it's somehow given in the order of things that democracy, which is almost the worst form of government, is the most friendly to philosophy because it's the most pluralistic 
it's the most um, open-minded. Uh, and not only that, but all the personality types of the five regimes can be encountered in democracy. In other words, in a democracy, you're surrounded by people who are aspiring tyrants, aspiring oligarchs, um, aspiring Democrats. And so they're on hand for the philosopher to study. Now that would not be the case um, in, in democracy. Uh, it's even been argued that um, Socrates himself would not be tolerated in the best regime. Be because in the best regime, there has to be a certain code that, that is not open to question. Hmm. And, and so Socrates' radical skepticism would be something he'd have to keep under wraps. And so it, it just seems to me that there is uh, an irreparable contradiction between what's arguably the best form of government uh, and the form of government that's most conducive to the philosophic life. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I know of no way of reconciling those things, right? I mean, uh, democracy, you know, I mean, it, 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 if it's meant to resemble Sparta, we, we know from other sources that anyone who showed up at the borders of Sparta was just politely told to go to hell. <laughs> uh, we don't like foreigners. We don't want you here. Um, we don't want our way of life destabilized. So, yeah, that, that's as far as I can get with that. And, and um, you know, it, it is odd, I guess, this is making me think. It is very peculiar in a way of Plato to prescribe a certain kind of uh, ranking of government while at the same time having to imply or concede that his own Socrates would really only be comfortable in a democracy, which is one of the worst, one of the worst regimes. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, so here is the here is the question uh, from Lucia. Socrates claims that no present regime is suitable for the nature of philosophy to be fully accomplished. Although one can still presume the philosophic way of life in his private life, does it mean that to create the best regime, we all have to become philosophers? That's what it would require. Um, I'm of the opinion, and, and th this is, this is um, uh, not like Bloom's interpretation. I, I believe that Socrates thinks that the philosophic nature itself suffers from not having a direct um, role in ruling. And so I, I, take, I take the education of the guardians in book seven in how to govern quite, quite seriously. Uh, I, I think that Socrates, you know, when he talks, when he talks about how the city is the sophist and how the place of philosophy is, is usurped by charlatans, I think he also implies that the philosopher's experience of life falls somewhat short because that person doesn't get to have the experience uh, of, of governing. But as to whether everyone could become a philosopher, I, I'm, I'm thinking in principle that this could not be the case for Plato or for any other classical thinker. I, I mean, later you'll get someone like Hegel saying that, you know, all of mankind can perform the ascent toward the sunlight. Um, but, but I think that requires a modern faith in enlightenment and, and um, sort of raising everybody to a kind of philosophic level, where, whereas Plato seems to imply that there are just these hardened distinctions um, between the philosophic and the non-philosophic. Although Socrates does stress several times in the Republic that there must be room for upward and downward mobility based on meritocracy. In other words, it must, it must be possible that um, you know, sons, of and sons and daughters 
and remember, of course, it's always it's always both genders. That that sons and daughters of the auxiliary class, it must be possible for them to ascend to the guardian class, and it must also be possible for unworthy guardians' offspring to be expelled to a lower class. Uh, and he says that if that if that principle of just meritocracy isn't held to, then the best regime will just become a caste. It, it would just become another, another privileged caste. So, so yeah, it's a complex kind of argument because there, there, there does seem to be allowance given for uh, rising and falling in life according to your natural merit. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, an, just a clarification, in, in the perfect city, of course, the auxiliary would, would uh, know their place, would fulfill their duty, but, but wouldn't even aspire to be the philosopher, would they, or am I wrong? Well, I, I think, I think um, that, that's true overall, um, but he, he does seem to suggest, um, I think, in, in book three, when he first introduces the guardians as a sort of separate group from the auxiliaries that there, there could be kind of like in between cases where a thumotic person, a person primarily characterized by being thumotic could also be relatively more open to the philosophic life. The, the, in other words, the, the, three, the three states of the soul in the city, I think also allow for a large series of intermediate mixes, right? Because, because the other side of the problem with the whole city soul parallel is that um, if, if the auxiliary class is defined preeminently through their being thumotic, then isn't there already a problem with them even being open to the, to the, to the rule of, of the, uh, of the guardian class? I mean, that's, that's why you need these, these lies, as, as Socrates quite frankly characterizes them. They have to be given a certain code, like how to believe in the gods, which is kind of quasi-philosophic, but it's not directly philosophic. And so, you know, as, as, as he says at the end of book five, what happens if these men were educating find out that we've been telling them lies. I think the implication is that it might be a very unpleasant experience when, when they find this out. We have another question from RN Library. You mentioned that democracy is tied with equality. So I would like to ask in which aspect is democracy equal and is not uh, equality rather tied with other regimes such, such as communism? Um, I just want to make sure I understand yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, you can you can see it in the chat. You mentioned that democracy is tied with equality, so I I would like yeah, to ask: right. in which aspects is democracy equal, and is not equality rather tied with other regimes such as communism? Well, equality, of course. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Socrates' presentation of democracy is. is really just a kind of um, unrestrained individualistic hedonism. Uh, it, it's, it's already on the way to becoming a mob. Uh, so there's, there's no suggestion of the kind that we would make in, in modernity that you could have a regime that was both premised upon human equality and therefore democracy but which would be capable of self-restraint through various institutional and representative mechanisms. Socrates just does not apparently conceive of that as a possibility. Uh, and, and, and hence, you know, that, that's why for, for so many centuries, this, this disparaging view of democracy was really the e day fix of the educated classes of, of Europe, uh, su such that when, you know, the American founders were, were talking about what they meant by their new republic, 
they were constantly saying, like Alexander Hamilton said, please don't confuse this with ancient Greek democracy because that was just a hopeless careening between anarchy and tyranny. No, this is a constitutional republic. So I just don't think you're going to find um, an account in Plato that would grant that democracy could somehow be conjoined with, let's say, a, a collectivist regime principle. Um, it, it's, it seems like for Socrates, at least for the Platonic Socrates, uh, some form of constitutional government would have to be to some extent aristocratic or at least democratic. Uh, and um, I mean, as I said, that, that, that's, you know, Plato's account of democracy put together with Thucydides, I think helps us understand why uh, the very idea of democracy was considered a terrible idea for, for many centuries uh, afterward. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, not to range too far afield, but you know, it's very different, say, in Aristotle's politics. I mean, one of one of Aristotle's objections to Plato is that in, in, in implicitly the only legitimate form of government he recognizes is monarchy. That that the best regime is actually ruled by one man, the philosopher, who owns it like it was his personal property. So with Aristotle, you started to get this notion that. Well, why can't we conjoin the benefits of equality with the restraints of, you know, political institutions? And so in his famous discussion of polity, uh, he, he seemed, you know, which he characterizes as sort of middle class society that is the most inclusive of regimes in his typology, but which contains a genuinely aristocratic element. Uh, I, 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 I just don't think we find that much in, in Plato. And, and that's why Aristotle critiqued Plato in, in that way. Uh, let me just clarify the, the, the issue of communism, because of course uh, it, it appears in Republic, but, but as, a, as, a, as a different, different uh, regime or different concept than modern communism, which might somehow confuse you where modern communism, yeah, it's equality, economic equality. That's what Republic, you find in, uh, in Republic, but that there is a total inequality political because, because there is no, no, uh, no space for, for, for other classes, other opinions. It has to be one rule. So, so, so it's a different, although it's the same term. So maybe that what, what yeah. confused you. Yeah, my answer might have been a bit obtuse. I, I mean, I don't, I don't like to argue from extrinsic sources, but it is interesting in classical antiquity, if you look at the commentaries on Plato and other philosophers by uh, Aulus Gellius or the Deipnosophists, um, uh, Athenian Attic Nights, these are kind of like compendiums of stories about the great thinkers and you know some of them are thought to be kind of like People Magazine, but others are, you know, parts of it are taken to be, you know, maybe authentic. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's interesting that when you look through those uh, Hellenistic and Roman era discussions of, of the ancient philosophers, Plato, uh, uh, that never anywhere do you encounter someone who thinks that the best regime was meant seriously by Plato as a political project. It, it's just taken for granted that that's not the case. Uh, that, that it, it, it's interesting, really, we call it the first great utopia, and yet in Greco-Roman antiquity, apparently no one thought that it was meant in any way, literally. It, it was just taken for granted that it, it was probably meant to show that uh, the demands of perfect justice would always have to exceed what any government is capable of. And, and therefore it's a salutary reminder that um, it's not really within our grasp to have a fully communistic society because of the love of one's own will always interfere with that and, and that we shouldn't even want it. But you know, it's 
to me, the Republic is kind of a thought experiment saying, what would it be like if we could completely get rid of the love of one's own? What, what would a society look like if you did that? You know, and that's, that's, the, that's the Kallipolis. But I think it becomes pretty apparent, you know, by, by book four and five that it, it's just neither possible nor even desirable that, that you, would, you would want to create a regime that would attempt to obliterate self-interest on every level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's another question um, from Michael. In the book six, Socrates talks about corruption of the majority of the city by the ruler and vice versa. Also, if we take into account the possible changes of human nature and in the same manner, the regime, then if the regimes have become tyrannical, then human nature of their citizens can become tyrannical too. May this be considered by Socrates' logic to be ma a mad city? How distant then is anarchy from tyranny? Or should we consider tyranny to be a regime with anarchical elements because of the tyrant's hunger for fulfillment of his personal desires? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great formulation. Certainly in the Republic, it seems to me that Socrates in book eight is suggesting that democracy is already close to something like anarchy, that, that it, it, it just has, has no principle of moderation and, and that therefore the tyrant in a way is the idealization of what the Democrat wants. The, the tyrant's the person who gets to have maximum self-indulgence and pleasure. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the, the tyrant as demagogue and the mob. Um, and then what was the other? Um, mm -hmm. Well, the, 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 the uh, 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 let's see. The regime have become tyrannical, then human nature of its citizen can become tyrannical too. May this be considered by Socrates' logic to be mad city. How distant then is anarchy from tyranny? Yeah, right. So, so, so he 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 does, of course, argue uh, uh, in in uh, book five and six that it is the city that is the great sophist. The city is the great corrupter of the youth, not by implication him, as he will eventually be tried for. Uh, it's the city that uh, meets together. You know, he describes it very vividly as this great beast. Uh, that is roaring and bellowing, and that they seduce the best natures among the young. And I'm pretty sure he's referring to Alcibiades here, that, that souls that would otherwise have been favorably inclined or, or potentially inclined to be philosophic are seduced by the mob of the city uh, and turned into their, their servants. So, so yes, again, it's a very unflattering from our perspective depiction of, of democracy. Um, and, and again, I, you know, I, one of my favorite examples of this is, is Federalist Nine, where Hamilton basically says that democracy and tyranny are kind of just two, two sides of the same thing, right? That, that ancient Greek democracy is always on the verge of veering to the extreme of either anarchy or tyranny. And, and that's why the new science of politics, as he refers to it, is not gonna rely on the good character of the ruler because that is too iffy a proposition, you know? Because as he says, people like Pericles only come along, right? Like decades, every few decades. And when they do come along, you can't really be sure they're not tyrants in disguise, right? Like they may present themselves as, you know, I'm the guardian of virtue, but then they might turn out to be a tyrant. And so, yeah, I, I you know, I, I, I think that um, it, it's a circle that can't be squared in, in ancient thought that you could have such a thing as a truly virtuous democracy. It, it just doesn't seem to 
be something that um, they, they could entertain. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to welcome Derek Kauke. He's another student of yours. We, we studied Hegel phenomenology to, together. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> hello, hello, Derek. Hi, how are you? Yeah. And then, well, okay. So, you, Ian, you, you, you wanted to, to have a question at the, the beginning. So, please, and of course, students, please write a, a, a question or, 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 or ask the question, but we just open it to everyone. Yeah. Uh, you suggested that um, maybe tyranny was distorted into a particular type of tyranny, um, you know, that it's overly erotic as opposed to certain rationalistic honor loving elements. Um, I wondered if what your opinion was about what he was doing with democracy, whether something like that was going on as well, just because um, it's hard It's hard for me to read the description of democracy as it's given in the Republic and think, oh, these people could have defeated the Persians in battle or yeah. like, these people would have killed Socrates. <laughs> so I, I was wondering what your, your thoughts were on the emphasis on the soft or decadent aspects of democracy as opposed to the harder aspects of democracy that are possible, it seems to yeah. me. It, it's a great observation, um, especially what you say about, uh, about their role in, um, in defeating the Persians. Uh, and um, I guess I would just have to throw up my hands and say that um, in, in the Platonic Socrates depiction of democracy, he does not seem to concede these, these um, more civic spirited uh, elements. And I guess I have no antecedent position to fall back behind from that because it, it, it just seems, uh, it just seems a given. Well, uh, do, you, do you think that's a, do you think that's a mistake on, on Plato's Socrates part or do you think that's a deliberate distortion? Um, I think it's a deliberate distortion um, for for the uh, for the the overriding pedagogical purpose of somehow deflecting young natures like that of Glaucon away from the hedonistic self indulgence that Socrates seems to identify as the primary characteristic of democracy. Um, and, and by the way, in, in a number of the Platonic dialogues, like the Theages, it's just taken for granted somehow that all of the young people think tyranny is the best way of life. Um, right. So yeah, but, but I mean, you're, you're quite right that a figure like Diodotus in, in Thucydides, a, a, a kind of democratic statesman who is capable of trying to stem the excesses of the demos or Pericles, they just don't seem to be present for Socrates. And you, you probably remember that in the Gorgias, Callicles is absolutely shocked when Socrates denies that Pericles was a good ruler. I mean, he's just speechless. And, and that I think shows the sense in which what Socrates means by virtue of the good almost defines politics out of existence. I mean, you could you could make a real make a real argument for that. Before before Bella posed the question, can I have a clarification, Randy? And that goes to the big kind of early discussion whether whether there is a distinction between Socrates and Plato. And here on this example that In mentioned, is that of course for for Plato who was not happy about uh, Athenian democracy at all. Whereas Socrates knew he was in the battle. He, he fought for, 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 for Athenian democracy himself as a soldier. So he must have seen that it has its, its civic values, its, its inspiration. Wouldn't that be the distinction between the two, the, the Plato and Socrates, or, or the, that there is a discrepancy enough in, in this case, or not really? I think there's a lot of evidence that um, Plato and his Socrates are not always of the same viewpoint. Um, 
like there's a telling, a small but telling example of this again in, in uh, the Gorgias where, um, where uh, Socrates gets Callicles to identify um, the art of ruling with prudence, with, with phronesis. And then Callicles adds, uh, but the ruler also has to possess courage. And I think that that's a kind of supplementation on Callicles' part of Socrates' wish to assimilate the art of ruling entirely to an intellectual virtue. And Socrates actually allows Callicles' emendation to stand, uh, that, that the true ruler will be both prudent and courageous. So I think as a hermeneutical principle, we always have to remind ourselves that um, Socrates is a character uh, in these dialogues. They're like dramas uh, and, and no playwright necessarily regards one of his characters as his perfect mouthpiece or, or funnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. B Bella, did you want it to, to ask? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, Randy. I, hi, I, have, I have two points. One is a relatively small one and one is a major one. A relatively small one has to do with the notion of consequences. I think that... Uh, there is a, a bit of a confusion uh, with the discussion at book two with uh, Glocken, because I think what Glocken must have meant is do not uh, show us that justice has external consequences. I think, I think the, 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 the point is that Socrates would certainly say that justice has very major consequences for the just person individually for his soul so i think we have to make make a distinction between two kinds of consequences consequences in terms of reputation what the world thinks of you what you could benefit by pretending to be just but i think but i think socrates uh, <clears throat> wants to say that <clears throat> being just is its own reward hence the consequence of being just is basically to be happy and well having a well balance so that's a small point i don't know if you want to talk about that but i have a, a much major yeah major. sure no do the, do the second. <laughs> sorry continue on to the second uh, point. well the second point uh, is major because i i fundamentally agree with disagree with your reading of the republic and i fundamentally agree with the strauss bloomian reading of the republic I want to preface what I'm saying by saying that I believe that the Republic was a, a, a work in progress, which was never, never reached its final form until the end of, very close to the end of Plato's life. But I want to come to concrete things. You, you made a point, and one of, the, one of the things that I really want to object to in the Bloomian interpretation is this mythology of philosophers. I think book nine, when he talks about the second argument for the superiority of philosophers over tyrants, he sounds very much like he sounded in book two. And I'm going to turn to, turn to those passages. And uh, he says, philosophy, the philosopher is a love of learning and being philosophical. In other words, philosophical as he uses it, as he uses it there is, uh, is uh, much more modest than this high, highly esoteric notion of philosophy portrayed in book six and seven. I, I, I believe also that uh, contrary to what you were saying, according to book four, which I think is the central, which to me is the most important part of the book, anybody can be, anybody can be just, should be just. This is four, 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 three, 443 CD. Let me read you it. And justice, and in true justice, it seems something of this sort. However, it isn't concerned with someone doing his own externally, but with what is inside him, what is duly him. Okay, one who is just does not allow any part of himself to do 
the work of another part. I'm going to jump a few. He regulates well what is really his own and rules himself. He puts himself in order, is his own friend, and harmonizes the three parts in himself like three limiting notes. He binds together those parts and any others that may be. Only then does he act. And when he does anything, whether acquiring wealth, taking care of the body, or engaging in politics, or in practice, in other words, he's, he's addressing every man. And he's, taught, he's saying that every man can be just, and every man who is just will conduct its normal civic life in a healthy manner and be a healthy individual and will be a just citizen. Now, uh, this to me is key to that. Uh, and I, I, I think that if we look at book nine seriously, without the assumption that book nine was written after book six and seven, but that we assume that book nine was written perhaps only after book four, then we see that the kind of resonance of philosophy in book nine is it goes back to books two and three. It doesn't have anything to do with books six and seven. And, and, and it seems to me uh, that... Uh, yeah, maybe maybe Randy could answer and then we could... Can I finish, please? Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, and another reason I, I have here is because in book nine, there's some strange things. He talks about women in a very contemptuous way, which, uh, which doesn't really square with uh, what he says about women's equality in uh, in book uh, in book five. Anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that, uh, Randy. Uh, I I think this would require a much longer discussion. But I I, I just want to point to some specific things in book nine, which which to me illustrates that the reference is not really to book six and seven, but it's more to book books two and three and four. That is. Anyway. Okay. Well. Um... I'll, I'll respond as best I can. Um, it seems to me that the, um, the search for justice in book four is always about not only the individual soul, but the city. In other words, there's three states of the soul and three classes in the city. So I disagree with you that justice is ever treated by uh, Socrates as something that is intrinsically satisfying to a separate individual. I, I think that um, the way that the question is posed in book two uh, by Glaucon and Adiamantus is, is simply ignored by Socrates because he knows he'll never be able to prove that justice is solely choice worthy as a form of personal happiness. I think that's too Kantian a kind of position. It's too apolitical. I do agree with you about um, the possibility of everyone in the city practicing justice. I think that's correct. Uh, when when you look at the um, you know the, the the proof in book four, uh, the proof the, the proof by subtraction, where you identify the cardinal virtues and then you you identify where they are in the soul in the city, and then what's left over is justice. Um, to me, it's noteworthy that uh, only um, the top two classes of the city are said to be characterized by a specific virtue. In, in other words, the guardians and the individual parallel, the philosopher possess the virtue of wisdom. The auxiliaries, the individual parallel being the spirited person possesses the virtue of courage. But justice and moderation are seemingly strung throughout the three classes of the city and the three states of the soul uh, to create a kind of harmony. Um, I have to just leave it at saying that I utterly disagree with you um, about um, the fact that the philosophic life as presented in book nine does not draw directly on the evocation of the philosophic life in book seven. I'll just have to leave it at that. Uh, I, I think, by the way, arguments made from the provenance of the dialogues are just hopeless, hopelessly um, irresolvable. We, we, will never, we will never solve the problem 
of the order in which those dialogues are written. All of the stuff about early, middle, and late um, is just sheer hypothesis. It's, it's sheerly suppositious. Mm-hmm. I do think there's a thematic distinction that you can make um, within the dialogues. But at, at the end of the day, you know, if you assume that the apology was one of the early protreptic dialogues, Plato could have been reworking it on the last day of his life. Uh, so I guess that's, uh, that would be what I have to say um, for now. Can I reply, uh, Randy? Uh, I think uh, uh, nobody has the final word on the composition of the, on the Republic, neither, neither the Unitarians nor the Fragmentarians. But I think whether you opt for one or the other does make a difference to how you interpret it. Uh, but I want to come to a specific point. I want to go back to book four and towards the, at the very end of book four, at 444-45, he says, and, 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 and before I read that, I disagree with you. I think books two to four are very much about the individual soul. The city is there only as a model. And of course, there's things said about the city, what is a just city, but I think the motivation is to show how an individual soul can be just by completely and categorically disagree with you. So then let me read, then let me read, let me read, then let me read in book four. So it now remains, it seems to inquire whether it is more profitable to act justly, live in a fine way and be just, whether one is known to be so or not, or to act justly and be unjust, provided one doesn't pay the penalty and become as a, so Socrates, uh, this inquiry l- looks really, really in, in other words, this, this at the end of the book, it makes it clear that now, now we've, uh, we've more or less proven what he goes back to in book nine, that it is the just life is much more beneficial to the individual soul. And we, ha- we come to the conclusion now that if the soul is organized in this fashion where all the parts are balanced, it's a happy and healthy soul. And just one more thing, you mentioned the Gorgia several times. And it's, not, it's notable that in the Gorgias, again, philosophy is contrasted with the uh, Leonexic life, okay? Uh, the, the, but it's interesting that philosophy in the Gorgias, as it is in books, two, three, and I think in book nine, is highly associated with moderation. The philosophical individual is happy because he's more moderate. So in a sense, uh, I think uh, we should not lose sight of the fact that one of the great, one of the great advantages of a philosophic life, to whatever degree, to the individual, is that it instills moderation. It instills think, moderation by having a grasp of the whole soul, sure. anyway. I think I made precisely that point in my remarks that the philosophic life of Socrates presents it entails moderation and justice and the other virtues. So there's, there's, no, there's no dispute there. Um, as for the rest, I, I would simply observe that um, Socrates doesn't simply use the city as a model for virtue in the individual. He says we cannot know what justice is in the individual until we find out what it is in the city. And also, you know, my position doesn't require me to disagree with you in any way that Socrates means justice to be an intrinsically satisfying way of life for the individual. That's precisely what I think is behind the the parallel that he proposes between the city and the soul. So I, I'm not placed in a position whereby I have to somehow disagree with what you say about the satisfaction of justice in the individual. In fact, I entirely agree with it. But I do maintain that for Socrates, that cannot come about until we first see what justice is writ large in the city. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, is is maybe one more more Phil, please. Thank you, Sam. Um, 
Randy, I just had a question that um, touches on the issue of the philosophical way of life and maybe kind of a spin-off from Ian's question about one-sidedness portrayals in Republic. And you mentioned that um, there's a shift away from the comparison of the tyrant to the just person to the between the tyrant and the philosopher. And to the extent that the portrayal of tyranny is one-sided or leaves something out. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on whether the portrayal or depiction of the philosophic life in Republic leaves anything out. But I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that at all. Well, um, this in a way circles back to um, what uh, Bailey and I were discussing. And in this context, I want to remark that I don't follow a certain line of Straussian thinking that maintains that the philosophic life is, is the only life worth pursuing and the only source of virtue. And that the teaching about civic virtue in books one to four is nothing but a kind of um, exoteric shell for uh, the complete superiority of the philosophic life. I, I think that Socrates really does mean to say that philosophers themselves need to be educated in the civic virtues uh, of, of moderation and, and that they themselves benefit, therefore, from that kind of civic education, even though in a, on a certain level they may transcend it. Um, so I, I, I kind of view Plato's approach very much in terms of Diotima's ladder in the symposium, that, that it's, it's, it's a progressive ascent uh, of both the mind and the passions, uh, but it's also cumulative. In other, in other words, you can't ascend to the highest level of that pyramid without going through the lower levels of, of family life uh, and, and of civic virtue. Um, now, uh, as to, as to um, the depiction of the philosophic life, you're asking if it leaves certain things out or? Oh, you're. Sorry, I was muted. No, I think you, you've, uh, yeah, you've answered in a way, Randy, it was just yeah, whether you had a sense of um, any abstractions in relation to the philosophic life, as you suggested there might be in terms of the portrayal of the tyrannical life, given that that ultimately becomes the comparison in book nine, the tyrant versus the philosopher. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I should add that I think Plato's metaphysical teachings are indispensable to his moral and political teachings. I'm, I'm with Schleiermacher there. Um, but, but by the same token, I think that uh, Plato's metaphysics are never more than speculative. They're, they're, they're not presented as a kind of um, deductively necessary doctrine. It's, it's not like Thomism or something like that, right? Like, I think Socrates has a few, what he regards as fruitful hunches. Let, let's put it that way. Like the analogy of virtue to a craft. I think that's a fruitful hunch on Socrates' part. Uh, when he actually attempts to evoke the philosophic life in book seven, he says to Glaucon, I can't give you a direct account. All I can do is give you an image, uh, an image of the good, right? A again, it's a fruitful hunch, um, but, but, but um, it, 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 it therefore always remains open-ended and speculative. And I also think that the presentation of these metaphysical hunches is also very much a matter of the uh, psychology of the interlocutors in, in, in the different dialogues, right? So, so, so Theotetus needs a different kind of uh, therapy than, than Glaucon because he has a different kind of, he has a different kind of character. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Good. Bella, the last question. Uh, Randy, I believe that uh, uh, Plato's metaphysics is the highest form of his philosophy. 
And I think that the most profound insight into morality comes from a profound insight into metaphysics. But I hope you don't want to say that to be moral in the ordinary sense of being just and leading a just life requires metaphysics in its highest form. No, I wouldn't say that. But I think the Republic argues that it does require a correct opinion. And correct opinion literally means correct seeming. Uh, and it's noteworthy that the very first time the, the Greek words eidos and idea appear in the Republic is in book three, where Socrates talks about how we have to envision the gods. We have to envision the gods as never changing shape. They're always at one with themselves. Uh, and, and therefore, I think that the the presentation of that reformed theology is already in a way a run up to the full blown metaphysical account given in book six and seven. But I would agree with you that um, strictly speaking, no, one doesn't need to study metaphysics to be a moral person. But I, I do think Socrates is arguing that one's educational horizon has to be shaped in a certain way to favor moderation and balance over disarray and impulse. And that's a kind of quasi-philosophical treatment, it, it, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just one point. Would you, would you not say that a quasi-philosophical person is one who has a global view of itself and one's relation to one's society and environment? And I think that this is having a right opinion about the world, about oneself. And I believe that one could be entirely just, fully just, given one's own capacities and inclination, having this. Now, of course, the philosopher will underwrite the right, the right opinion, okay? But that underwriting is not necessary for everyday existence. I can't, I can't disagree with you about that. I, th I think I would largely concur with, with that as, as, you, uh, as you phrased it there, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Randy. That was really a pleasure to, 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 again, to see you at least uh, virtually and, yeah. and then to hear, to hear your, your take on, 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 uh, on Plato's Republic and, and I'm sure the, the students benefited greatly. Okay. And, and, and as, as they did from the other discussions. And, and, and I hope you can join us next week when Matthew Post will be speaking. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try my best. It, it's been uh, rather perverse that, that this time of day, every Wednesday, is I have something to do, like a doctor's <laughs> appointment. I just really mundane things, but I, I will try to come for maths. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, wow. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was good to good to see you. Great to see you, Phil. Uh, Derek, um, hello. Uh, maybe the students. I mean, uh, maybe we could stay a few minutes longer. But students, if you are if you are uh, uh, eager to, please go to the the, the garden and and uh, pick up the wine. It's in my in my fridge, please, because I, I will still still go on a little bit to talk. So so come and come and take it. Uh, I'm sure I'm uh, sure you would be happy to join us, uh, Randy. But but, but yeah, I'm missing but, the best part of it. I, absolutely, <laughs> we will we will continue to 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 think. Well, okay. Thanks okay. for having me. I really enjoyed it. Nice okay. to see you all. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh,